Red Alert on the Atlantic. Carrier Strike Group 8, a heavily armed naval formation headed by an aircraft carrier, is out on the Atlantic to rehearse a real case scenario. The purpose of the four-week maneuver is to practice the tactical interplay between the warships prior to engaging in combat. Three nations are involved. Any mission, anytime, anywhere, we're ready to go. The centerpiece of the group is its flagship, the carrier Harry S. Truman, a 1,093 feet long floating small town with a military airport. With 5,600 personnel on board, the Truman can accommodate 49 jet fighters. During the exercise, its crew will handle several thousand takeoffs and landings. The physical demands are so massive that all those involved always have to push themselves to the very limit. Being out here is definitely stressful. It's a very stress-high environment. A further 1,400 naval personnel are serving on the group's destroyers and frigates. Over the next few weeks, they too will be engaged in the most demanding military exercises. Fire on board has to be combated swiftly and effectively. Medical teams have to ensure that those with injuries or burns receive prompt attention. Man overboard, man overboard. And anyone going overboard into the cold waters of the Atlantic has to be rescued with all haste. Far away from the mainland, the warships will fire thousands of rounds of ammunition and launch dozens of rockets. Attacks will be controlled tactically from the group's operation centers. Stress in a confined space in the tough daily routine of life in the Navy. Warning, sir. Warn unidentified approaching aircraft in order to indicate our capacity for action and that of the force. Commander, over and out. To defend peace on the world's oceans, that is the reason why 7,000 sailors, soldiers, and pilots are prepared to endure four weeks of torture on the high seas. Four weeks that will see them grow together to form a powerful carrier group. Norfolk Naval Base in Virginia is the biggest naval base in the world. It is from here that the warships of Carrier Strike Group 8 will set out to take part in one of the toughest military maneuvers staged by the U.S. Navy. Its flagship is the huge aircraft carrier USS Harry S. Truman. Special tugs are needed to maneuver the 95,000-ton Colossus through the port area. The carrier will then head straight into its area of operation, the Atlantic. The crews of five other warships and a hunter submarine have also said goodbye to their families. Among them, the crew of the frigate Hessen, a German special ship that is a newcomer to the carrier group. The 20,000 horsepower tugs also help the Hessen to reach the open sea. Out on the ocean, each of the seven units takes up its tactical position for the forthcoming Comp2X maneuver. The group must pass this comprehensive battle training exercise. Only then will it be regarded as combat ready. The focus of every operation by Carrier Strike Group 8 is the USS Harry S. Truman, a Nimitz-class American aircraft carrier. 1,093 feet long and 250 feet wide, this floating military airbase is one of the biggest ships of its kind. The Truman is protected by five other warships and a hunter submarine. They include two high-tech destroyers, the Arleigh Burke and the Jason Dunham. Both vessels are equipped with state-of-the-art electronic weapons systems. 
Ultra-sensitive radar and sonar systems detect attackers and transmit their coordinates to the ship's missile launchers. An American cruiser, the USS Normandy, serves the carrier as a floating missile screen. The eyes and ears of the strike group is a German naval vessel, the Hessen. Its special field is aerial reconnaissance. The smallest ship in the group is the Roald Amundsen, a frigate belonging to the Royal Norwegian Navy. Together with a Los Angeles-class hunter submarine, it circles the entire group like a guard dog in order to repulse attackers from all sides. Supreme Commander of Carrier Strike Group 8 is Admiral Eugene Black. He controls and monitors every operation by the group. The Admiral is ever mindful of the task of his Carrier Strike Group. 98% of the commerce that flows across the globe flows at sea. And strike groups and the ships that make them up and the aircraft guarantee that free flow. It's the start of a new shift on the deck of the Harry S. Truman. Today, the crew will be taking part in a complex air defense exercise. All 49 combat jets will soon be taking off in quick succession. But first, the crew have to check every millimeter of the flight deck. Any piece of metal, no matter how small, could become a serious threat to the jets on takeoff. The flight deck has a special surface comprised of a mixture of rubber and scouring powder. This makes it extremely durable and ensures that despite the moist sea air, it is especially skid-proof. With the runway only 820 feet long, this is hugely important when the fighters take off and land. The Foreign Objects Debris Walk, FOD for short, is a mandatory part of the morning program. Despite the tremendous care taken in working on deck, when the crew comb the 194,000 square foot runway, time and again they find dozens of small parts. Once the deck has been given the all clear for flight operations, the pilots head for the runway. Those allowed to take off here are among the elite of the US Air Force. After being put through special Top Gun training, the pilots have passed the Naval Flight School's toughest test, an accolade which, amongst other things, brings with it permission to take off and land on aircraft carriers. Uh, this air wing, uh, comprised of the several squadrons that we have aboard, uh, come from five different bases. Uh, when we do our separate training in those five bases, we then come together for different air wing events uh, so that we can practice working together, and then we come aboard the aircraft carrier for several different training evolutions about 1,800 people in the air wing that when integrated with the 3,200 people in the aircraft carrier build quite a team of 5,000 people ready to go forth and do good work. Working on the deck of an aircraft carrier is highly strenuous for the men and women of the air wing and the pilots of the Super Hornets. A shift lasts 12 hours, sometimes even longer. Besides the physical exertions, the team have to cope with extreme noise, high temperatures, exhaust fumes, and fine dust. Despite this pressure, it must be perfectly clear what each person is responsible for. This is regulated by a special clothing scheme. Shirts of different colors identify the various teams and their jobs. Brown is the color worn by the plane captains. They are the aircraft technicians. Each jet bears the name of its technician. An unwritten law says that the Super Hornet is the plane captain's baby. The pilot of the F-18 merely borrows it from him. The sailors in purple call themselves grapes. They refuel the jets and manage the 12,000 tons of special fuel on board the Truman. JP-5 kerosene is a safety fuel with a particularly high flash point. Nevertheless, refueling the aircraft is a highly dangerous operation. Consequently, every valve on the tank hoses and the complex pump structure is monitored closely from the control center. Constant tests on fuel quality ensure there is no contamination, 
provide additional protection from possible explosions and guarantee maximum performance from the jets. The Truman carries fuel supplies for exactly one week. Then the carrier's kerosene store has to be replenished. Red identifies the weapons officers, known in the Navy as ordnance men. The aircraft carrier is equipped with guided missiles, bombs, and machine guns. Handling this explosive freight calls for total concentration. Consequently, no one, apart from the specially trained officers, is allowed to even touch the armaments. Shortly before takeoff, the ordnance men fit the Super Hornets with bombs. The jets are the carrier's main weapon. Without them, the steel giant would be virtually defenseless. Some of the bombs weigh up to a ton. The officers can only lift them and attach them to the jet with the help of a winch. The Super Hornet's machine gun is now loaded. In a dogfight, the crew would have exactly 578 rounds available. The jets are now combat ready. Time for the yellow shirts to go into action. They regulate the traffic on deck. With tow bar tractors, they pull the 15-ton fighter aircraft out of their parking spaces. Using hand signals, they then guide the pilots to their various takeoff positions. The jet blast deflector is raised, a seawater-cooled heat shield that provides protection from a jet's exhaust. From here on, the sailors in green, the hook runners, take over. Their job is one of the most dangerous on the flight deck. They are in direct contact with each pilot right up until takeoff. Each aircraft is directed to the catapult sled with absolute precision until the takeoff hook engages. The catapult then tightens, and the sled and the jet are under tension. The green shirts also program the catapult system. Based on the takeoff weight of the jet, they set the speed of the catapult, which must accelerate the F-18 so that it will take off at the end of the short runway. What happens is that below deck, steam is forced into a cylinder. When sufficient pressure has built up, the system is able to hurl a jet into the sky. The takeoff speed of an F-18 calls for steam pressure of 1,300 pounds. Things are now getting serious. The first Super Hornet is ready for takeoff. A final technical check sees the white-shirted aircraft inspectors instruct the pilot to activate all the flaps and control surfaces one last time. Then they give their go. The rest of the crew also give the thumbs up, and two seconds later, the first jet is airborne. The huge acceleration exerts a force of three Gs on the pilot, three times more than with top acceleration in a Formula One racing car. After 660 feet, the pilot has reached the takeoff speed of 155 miles per hour. The jet blast deflector is then immediately lowered to clear the way for the next F-18. The catapult sled moves back to its starting position. In all, there are four jet catapults on the deck of the Truman. Before each takeoff, the catapult crew checks to make sure they're free of dirt. Then the sign is given that the catapult system has been correctly set, and the green shirts direct the pilot to the catapult sled. The jet blast deflector protects the crew from the 2,300 degree Fahrenheit exhaust gas stream generated when the F-18 takes off. Another young pilot leaves the carrier at top speed. 
the chance to fly off the aircraft carrier with these young men and women, average age probably about 19 and a half, getting us airborne, launching off the carrier. It is a fantastic experience to see the different mission sets uh, on a daily basis as we're adjusting from one to the other, and I'm very, very, very happy about that. During the maneuver, all the jets have to take off and land at least once a day. According to a study by the aircraft manufacturer, working on the deck of a carrier is more stressful for the flight personnel than actual combat is for ground troops. This then is tough training geared to preparing the entire crew for U.S. naval operations worldwide. One particular challenge for the catapult crew is launching E-2D Hawkeye reconnaissance aircraft. In contrast to their F-18 colleagues, the pilots take off at the lower speed of 118 miles per hour. However, their aircraft are a lot bulkier and demand maximum concentration from the runway crew in the complicated setting of the catapult facility. But the well-coordinated teams on the deck of the Truman also master this challenge. During the takeoffs, the carrier's bridge and tower are also a hive of activity. To make it easier for the pilots to take off, the captain sails the vessel into the wind at full speed. This gives the jets additional lift and they consume less fuel. Known as a Ouija board, this is an air traffic control system that has been used on aircraft carriers since the Second World War. True to scale, it shows the 194,000 square foot flight deck of the Truman along with all the fighter aircraft. The flight crew are thus able to portray all the jet's movements on deck at all times. The board purposely has an analogical structure so that air traffic can be maintained even in the case of power failure. The last F-18 pilot now follows his colleagues. The so-called air defense exercise is underway. And for a short while, the deck crews on the Truman can take a breather. The airspace above the group is now full of combat-ready Super Hornets. The air defense exercise, ADEX for short, is in progress with the pilots simulating attacks on all six ships in the carrier strike group. The aim is to practice coordination between the various units in joint air defense. The combat aircraft have enough fuel for two hours, enough time to make the crews of the warships break out in a cold sweat. In order not to present an easy target, the floating war machines spread out, leaving their formation around the Truman at full speed. Only the two Arleigh Burke-class destroyers remain close to the carrier to protect its flanks. With their 127 millimeter cannon, they can hit targets up to 15 miles away. The USS Normandy provides protection from aerial attack. Its special area is missile defense. The vessel takes up position well away from the rest of the group. The KNM Roald Amundsen is specially designed to hunt enemy submarines. Its high-tech sonar system enables the Norwegian frigate to monitor what is happening below the surface. The most important warship in the air defense exercise is the German frigate Hessen. With its sensitive reconnaissance technology, it is the eyes and ears of the naval group. 
The operations center receives all the information on the ADEX maneuver. For the reconnaissance specialists on the high-tech vessel, the air defense exercise is the most important military maneuver in the entire Comptoex, a training program involving a total of some 200 naval combat maneuvers. In order to be allowed to participate in real combat operations, the sailors must complete today's exercise successfully. The Normandy bearing in 240 in 16 miles. Harry S. Truman goes on 015 at 1340 with 10. During the ADEX maneuver, the huge rotating radar on the stern of the frigate is the most important instrument for detecting an enemy. Costing around 15 million US dollars, the Smart Hell radar system is currently the most expensive but also most modern radar system in the world. It spans a hemispherical dome over the group with a radius of 250 miles. In addition to marine targets and jamming transmitters, the Smart Hell can detect, determine, and pursue up to 1,000 aerial targets simultaneously. No sooner has the maneuver begun than the radar picks up echo signals from fighter bombers, the Super Hornets from the Truman, which are supposed to simulate the enemy. The Smart Hell system immediately passes on the data to the operations center on board the Hessen. The jets are under the command of the fighter control officers on board the German frigate. These Air Force officers assume the tactical coordination for up to 10 Super Hornets, guide them as close as possible to the enemy, and give the order to open fire. We take control over these aircraft via radio and are authorized to issue orders and send them to a CAP, Combat Air Patrol Station. That is a predefined point where they fulfill their mission and from which they can then be used for further tasks. In the operations center, the radar and sonar data from the entire strike group are collated. The officers obtain a comprehensive picture of the situation on and below the surface. The display gives the group an immediate overview of danger situations at all times. This is one of the world's most modern operations centers. We can see land contours. We can see if an object is an aircraft or just a ship, or possibly even a submarine. The coloring enables us to tell fairly quickly if there's a threat to our ship or our group. We quickly inform the other ships in our group so that everyone has the same information. And based on this, we make a decision that can mean the difference between life and death. Two fighter bombers cannot be clearly identified. Some jets are equipped with a radar jammer, which masks the aircraft's strategic goal or transmits misleading information. The officers on board the frigate have noticed the intruders. It's an unknown, unidentified object. As long as he doesn't change his altitude, he's no threat to the force. However, the F-18 pilots are heading for the carrier group. They aggressively increase their speed and reduce their altitude, a clear sign of hostile intentions. Morning. Morning, reading on both contacts in the north. Frigate Captain Fennish now has to take a decision. The crew have warned the aircraft three times not to come any closer, but they're still approaching. We'll issue final warning to Dingbat, strength through. 6,000 feet in overflight. No response, Herr Kapitän. The aim of this exercise is to identify enemy aircraft in good time and warn them not to come any closer to the group. Then, if necessary, combat them. Despite a final warning, the pilots are staying on course. The Hessen is preparing for an attack. The German Navy frigate has a highly sophisticated multifunction radar system. The Active Phased Array Radar, APAR for short, is located in the ship's diamond-shaped tower. This fire control radar system tracks enemy targets via a focused beam of incessant radio waves. 
Once it has detected them, the radar can track several hundred aircraft and missiles simultaneously from a distance of 100 miles. The missiles guided by the radar systems can even hit jets traveling at supersonic speeds. In a real-life situation, Frigate Captain Fennig would now give the order to combat the enemy jet. The radar data are transmitted to the Arleigh Burke destroyers and the guided missile destroyer USS Normandy. They are combat ready in seconds and their defensive missiles can track and destroy attackers via the APARS guide beam. The destroyer's vertical launch system can fire a wide range of missiles. What they all have in common is that they hit their targets with a probability of 95%. The situation is getting too hot for the attacking aircraft. They pull off. The training exercises in the Atlantic are most realistic. One major element is the communication between the members of the group, who represent three countries. One AW2 ASUF, three ASW commander. It's about warning unidentified approaching aircraft in order to indicate as quickly as possible our capacity for action and that of the force. Commander, over and out. In combat situations, misunderstandings can prove fatal. So on the air defense exercise, the units rehearse every detail. The procedures and rules have to be learned precisely to rule out any communication errors. No problem. Unfortunately, we have bad comms on, on this net, uh, but uh, I hope that we uh, could deconflict uh, everything with the Papa Lima Lima and uh, the uh, helicopter arrival of your call sign to my ship. Commander Pfennig is not happy with the communication within the group during the ADEX. In a real combat situation, everything must function flawlessly. So he wants the exercise repeated, and that means a night shift for the entire Carrier Strike Group 8. In the meantime, it is pitch black on the flight deck of the Harry S. Truman. Takeoffs and landings are a huge challenge for the deck crews and the F-18 flying aces even in daylight. Now they need to have literally blind faith in one another because visual contact is no longer possible. In the dark, it is hard for the pilots to tell whether someone is wearing a yellow shirt or a green one. So the various teams on deck now use signal lamps. They shine in different colors and guide the pilots to the runway. Then the first F-18 takes off into the night sky. The darkness is also dangerous for the weapons officers, who are normally easy to identify in their red shirts. The missiles are sensitive, so when equipping the jets, the officers have to take great care not to stumble or move the wrong lever. But they're well trained, and every movement is performed just as accurately at night as it is in daylight. The last Super Hornet is ready to repeat the ADEX maneuver and takes off into the night sky. Once airborne, the pilots navigate according to their onboard instruments and the instructions from the Truman's tower. Landings on a carrier in the dark are complicated, but thanks to the constant training, the crews on deck are well prepared. Extremely robust steel cables are tensioned right across the flight deck to snag the Super Hornets and bring them to a halt from full speed. Catching a cable with the aircraft's tail hook at night is an almost acrobatic feat. When the last Super Hornet has reached the safety of its floating military airfield, the lights on the Truman's flight deck are extinguished. But the day's work is by no means over. 
For safety reasons, most of the $70 million combat aircraft spend the night in the carrier's hangar. Three giant elevators on the right-hand side of the steel giant and one on the left transport the 34-ton jets 33 feet below deck. Covering an area of 3,880 square feet, each of the deck edge elevators, as they're known, is roughly the size of a basketball court. The hangar itself is three decks high, about 25 feet, and consists of four sections which can be separated by bulkheads. On an area of 73,200 square feet, there's room here for 36 aircraft. Because of the cleverly devised shift system for the 5,600 men and women on board the Truman, there is always life on the ocean giant. When working on deck has been completed, the aircraft are serviced and cleaned in the hangar. The salty sea air is poison for the F-18's outer skin and its electronic systems. The mechanics meticulously check every inch of the aircraft. The landing gear has to shoulder the heaviest burden. Even though it has been specially reinforced, the impact of landing at full speed and the force of a catapult launch put enormous pressure on the undercarriage. Night after night, the crew in the carrier's hangar ensure the entire air wing remains ready for operation. A few hundred nautical miles from the coast of Florida, the Truman is now heading south. The mood on the bridge of this floating fortress is relaxed. Today there is no set program within the Comp2X training plan, and the units have no idea what to expect. Carrier Strike Group 8 is moving in a fictional theater of operations. A foil has been placed over the actual sea chart, which projects a virtual war zone onto the ocean. In this case, the maneuver map resembles the Middle East. The seven units are now heading for a 100-mile-long channel. The combat group still has no idea what awaits it. This artificial waterway is intended to represent the border between two continents. The channel is extremely narrow. So the warships in the carrier group have to abandon their strategic formation and negotiate the narrow passage one behind the other, a maximum distance of 1,100 yards apart. That small gap is dangerous, but the strike group has to sail so closely together in order to reach the open sea again as fast as possible. But at a full speed of 25 knots, the risk of a collision is always imminent. The vessel leading the convoy through the strait is the German frigate Hessen. With its high-tech radar, the Hessen is the carrier group's reconnaissance ace and will be the first vessel to detect any attackers. Sailing close behind is the USS Normandy. Its role is to protect the aircraft carrier, which is next in the convoy, from missile attacks. Behind the Truman and securing the convoy's rear are the KNM Roald Amundsen, and the two Arleigh Burke destroyers. At the head of the convoy, the Hessen is sailing at full speed. So far, everything is peaceful around the group. Commander Fennig is leading the units safely through the narrow strait. What is the speed of the carrier? 10. Carrier sailing at speed of 10 knots. New course, 230. Perfect. But if the carrier is only doing 10 knots, we have to make sure we're not going too fast. Passing through a strait is highly dangerous for the group. The narrow navigation channel makes it an easy target. The frigate's commander is suspicious. 
On the port side, hostile contact has been made. Three speedboats are approaching the group. They aim to force their way in between the ships. There, they'll be safe from attack because the risk of one member of the group hitting another with its missiles would be too great. The crew of the Hessen have to act immediately. The frigate's light naval gun is aimed at the attackers and the team open fire. Caution, fire. Each tap simulates a round from the light naval gun. Weapons must not actually be fired during the maneuver. Two of the speedboats have got through. They cross the convoy and appear to be escaping. To make sure they don't attack again, the captain requests aerial support from the Truman. Two MH-60 Seahawk helicopters take off from the carrier and head for the speedboats. These multi-mission helicopters can pursue attackers for hours at a maximum speed of 170 miles per hour. If threatened, they can climb to around 10,000 feet. The enemy boats have finally been put to flight. Since the helicopters are now at an acceptable distance from the carrier group, the pilots practice firing their Browning M2 machine guns. They also practice firing their missiles and their six-barreled fully automatic weapons on this area of open sea. On the fictional sea chart, the end of the strait is in view. The strike group wants to leave the danger zone as fast as possible and return to the open sea. The Hessen sets the speed and the other members of the strike group follow her. As soon as they have left the virtual channel, all the units in the group return to their tactical positions around the carrier. The Hessen now heads for the Truman's flank. But something is wrong. Suddenly, three red objects appear on the radar screen. Strike Group Command has loaded a new, and this time digital, maneuver scenario onto the frigate's computer. The three enemy warships exist only on the screen. Nevertheless, they must be combated. The ship has a positive position we want to take from it. We'll reduce speed. That will make the warship an overtaker, and it will have to take evasive action. It's the only chance we have of forcing our way between the warship and the carrier. New course, 090. With this new course, the Hessen is trying to block the attacker's path to the carrier. But the warships are proving provocative and refuse to give way. They want confrontation. A conflict is inevitable. Crew to combat stations to protect valuable unit Harry S. Truman and repulse all threats. The situation is now serious. The crew don their safety clothing. In the operations center, they are ready for action. All the crew are at battle stations. The situation is assessed by the captain of the frigate. He considers the best defense strategy and issues instructions to the crew. With every contact with the enemy, there is an internal and an external battle. For the outer battle, direct defense, the crew aim the ram launcher and the ship's cannon at the enemy vessel. The internal battle involves all the activities on board the frigate. The officer's mess, for example, is turned into a hospital. The enemy ships immediately open fire on the frigate. Even though this is a digital simulation, on the screens in the operations center, everything seems frighteningly real. Cover, cover, cover. 
Banga, banga, banga. Hit on the port side. Repeal cover. The Hessen has been hit directly behind the operations center. There's fire in 9 Bravo Zero. Smoke expansion equals room size. But the team in the operations center focused solely on the external battle, engaging the enemy. At the same time, their colleagues are preparing for the internal battle, rescuing the injured and putting out the fire. The enemy missile has destroyed the frigate's main weapons. VLS and RAM aft have been lost. RAM forward is redundant and we have fire in 9 Bravo Zero. It must be extinguished to launch harpoon missiles. And there is even worse to come. A jet fighter is taken off from the Truman. Its sole mission is to attack all the ships in the strike group. On board the Hessen, the next alert level has been declared. The officers have spotted the jet on the screen. It is heading low and fast for the frigate. Another impact can no longer be prevented. Cover, cover, cover. Banga, banga, banga. Another direct hit. In a real combat situation, a second highly effective military missile would have struck the frigate's steel hull. The crew in the operations center register the level of destruction on board. This interactive control monitor provides the officers with an overview of all the damage on board, including the fires. From here, the information is passed on immediately to the bridge and the operations center. The ship is in a disastrous state. Numerous sailors are missing or injured. The firefighting crews are trying to get control of a blaze directly behind the bridge. Fire is the greatest threat to a warship. With fuel, weapons, and bombs on board, a carrier in particular is a floating powder keg. So the crew of the Truman has to undergo some tough training. Together, everyone achieves more. The huge bulkheads in the Truman's hangar are closed in the attempt to stop the fire spreading. Dozens of firefighting crews are taking part in this exercise so that in a real emergency, they will function perfectly together. The firefighting gear is as heavy as lead. To make sure it fits correctly, it has to be put on with help, even in the most extreme situations. It's the only way to ensure that crew members are optimally protected from the extreme heat. The fire chiefs practice every step with the firefighting crews until they become second nature. In dense smoke, team members can quickly lose their bearings. So it is vital to maintain contact with the person next to you. The hatches and gangways on the Truman are extremely narrow. This makes the design of the huge carrier particularly stable. But it presents an enormous challenge to the firefighters with their bulky equipment. Opening doors is particularly dangerous because of the threat of flashover, an explosion of flammable gases which sends a gigantic jet of flame shooting out of the room. Fire often results in injured sailors needing help as fast as possible. Burns are among the most lethal injuries, so every crew member must be able to treat them swiftly and sterilely. Fighting fires and rescuing injured sailors is one of the most important skills the crew trains in order to guarantee the survival of the 5,600 men and women on the Harry S. Truman in a conflict situation. The German frigate Hessen has taken two big hits. Weapon systems have been disabled and the whole ship is on fire. In 9 Bravo Zero, the rescue team find three seriously injured personnel. 
Getting them to safety takes top priority. The fire victims are removed through a lock into a smoke-free room. Paramedics provide first aid and assess the seriousness of the injuries. Please help, help me. An American soldier's face is severely burned. I have to breathe. Is there something cool down their face? OK. All right. It hurts really bad. I can't breathe. His friend has an open fracture of the arm and is bleeding. He's screaming in pain. This realistic scenario increases the paramedic's stress level. The aim of this exercise is for everyone to stay calm. It's too dangerous here for the injured. They need to be taken to the hospital. Carrying a wounded person through the narrow gangways is a feat of strength by the two men. Only a short while ago, the pair treating the wounds of the injured were preparing food for the crew. They're the frigate's cooks. Now they're lifesavers. They will stabilize the injured until the ship's doctor gets to the hospital. The ship's first officer records where the injured are located on board. His information on the internal combat situation is passed on to the control room and the operations center. Officers there can then see all the emergency situations and allocate rescue teams in an optimum way. All three injured personnel in the OHBR have been rescued. There is no need to fly out the worst case, the man with the lower arm fracture. Over the last few hours, the 255 men and women on board the Hessen have experienced a total state of emergency. But the crew of the frigate have mastered the situation. Their injured comrades have been taken care of and all the fires put out. Another COMP2X maneuver has been successfully completed. Commander Penish leaves the operation center. A Seahawk helicopter is about to land on the Hessen. On board is Strike Group Supreme Commander Admiral Eugene Black. He wants to get a first-hand view of the situation. He also wants to discuss a joint strategy for the COMP2X program for the next few days with the captain of the frigate. In the control room, the two men analyze the effects of the internal battle during the maneuver. In actual combat, the group leader must be able to rely totally on the units in his carrier strike force. I was so impressed. Uh, the sailors are motivated, they're well equipped, they're well trained, they're ready to do any mission um, from fighting the ship in terms of defending it or defending other, for example, this aircraft carrier, to uh, if they take battle damage, they're ready to stop the flooding and put out the fire. It was an impressive showing of a very capable ship, and I'm, I'm, I feel lucky that I got to go. So it's not as if we're certifying Hessen to be ready or not ready. We know she's ready. We're just working her into the team. Admiral Black is satisfied. The German frigate Hessen, a newcomer to the strike group, has passed the maneuver test. The German Navy's special ship is now an integral member of Carrier Strike Group 8. The force centered on the aircraft carrier USS Harry S. Truman. The units in the Naval Strike Force face another three weeks in the Atlantic. In particular, supplying the ships and the 7,000 sailors at sea will pose an enormous challenge. Tons of food, munitions, and fuel will have to be taken from deck to deck with the ship traveling at full speed. Supplying this floating small town in the middle of the ocean and preparing it for its forthcoming operations will be a further COMP2X test Carrier Strike Group 8 will have to pass. Only then will it be allowed to go into operation to safeguard peace on the world's oceans. <laughs>